Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, this, I'm really honored to be part of this uh, great group. And I, I just want to, I guess Jacqueline's not here, but all of you can tell her that I, I really appreciate uh, the invitation to be part of this. And I'm honored to be part of this panel and this um, entire event. Uh, uh, really, I, I started out this morning with a really wonderful discussion of black power that started, um, in some ways, I think this presentation will, will intersect with that and also, in some ways, with Z's presentation. Um, particularly thinking about uh, questions about periodization, um, how do we think about the, the trajectory of, of what, what I, I guess used to be called the movement. Um, today, there was a discussion about whether there were many movements, one movement. Um, I, I'd like to, to I think, my, this presentation will give us some ways to think about uh, how we periodize and distinguish uh, one movement from another. Also, particularly about radicalism and how we think, what do we mean when we use the term radicalism? Um, and I think it's particularly important uh, given, uh, sort of given this topic and the fact that I found that many of the ideas that I think we often associate with the radicalism of the late 1960s, particularly economic radicalism, socialism, um, uh, and, and also feminist radicalism of the late 1960s, I actually find emerged most uh, powerfully in the late 1950s and early 1960s. And, um, and I think that, that simply that challenges us to think about some of the distinctions that people would later make uh, between civil rights radicalism or civil rights activism and black power. Um, I, I, I want to share this quote from A. Philip Randolph's talk or speech to the March on Washington, which I think is actually, in some respects, um, a, a, a really remarkable speech. Few of us know it, you know, given, which is remarkable given that the speech that Martin Luther King gave, I think is, some have argued, is the most widely recognized piece of rhetoric ever delivered. Um, and in contrast, most of us have never even heard, seen the text of Randolph's speech. At the time, actually, if you go and you look at the reporting on the March on Washington, Randolph's speech was actually highlighted much more than King's speech. Um, and Randolph was, was routinely in all of the media, whether black or white media, recognized as the leader of this march and the person who really put it together and sh shaped the agenda. Um, and I think importantly, just in this very <coughs> tiny segment from it, um, I'll talk, I'll return to his speech, but Randolph refers to uh, the Civil Rights Revolution. I think that's significant. And he says, as, I, as he says here, um, that civil right, this Civil Rights Revolution is not confined to Negroes, nor is it confined to civil rights. And I, I think that's an important element of the, of the political trajectory out of which Randolph emerged um, in this movement. Um, in my view, the, uh, the March on Washington in 1963, more forcefully than any other event, linked the, the Southern civil rights movement's demands for integration and voting rights uh, to black trade unionists' struggle for, to dismantle the racial barriers to social citizenship in the New Deal order. Uh, the march was initiated by the Negro American Labor Council, which was a network of mostly northern, but not completely northern, uh, activists who converged to demand access to jobs, apprenticeships, and union protections controlled by affiliates of what was then the recently merged AFL-CIO. And actually, uh, I, I, I discovered this, I don't know, if, I, I've never heard of this reference before, but the march actually originated, the original idea with, for the march was to march on the headquarters of the AFL-CIO, mm -hmm. not, not on a government agency. And I think that's significant. The NALC expanded its agenda to uh, enlist support from the, the Congress of Racial Equality, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, groups that had emerged out of the struggles in the South, um, and united Northern and Southern radicals under the slogan for jobs and freedom. Um, they mobilized over a quarter million people to Washington on August 28, 1963. At the time, this was by far the largest march ever in, in US history. Um, to demand equal access to public accommodations, housing, education, voting rights, and quote, meaningful and dignified jobs at decent wages, unquote. Um, at the time, journalist Murray Kempton argued, and I don't think he exaggerated when he said, no expression one-tenth so radical has ever been seen or heard by so many Americans. 
one thing that I'm going to, I'm going to sort of show a number of images, because um, one, one thing that's been really interesting about this research is these really wonderful images I've found of the actual mobilization. And they're, they're profound. I mean, I think this one, just of the, the faces in the crowd, um, is an example of some of the things that I found. And I'll, I'll, some of them I'll comment on, and some I'll, I'll just scroll through, but we can return to them in the question and answer period. Um, scholars have paid increasing attention to, north, to labor based black radicalism in the past decade. But I think they've overlooked what, in some respects, I think is the peak of what uh, a number of scholars have referred to as civil rights unionism. Um, the, the role that, the central role that black trade unions played in organizing the March on Washington. Um, Tom Chigru, for example, dis dismisses the Negro American Labor Council as a quote unquote paper organization. Uh, claims that Randolph sort of single-handedly won support from unions just a few weeks before the march. Uh, Lucy Barber, who studied a number of, civil, of, of marches on Washington, focuses on prominent leaders of the, or sort of official spokesmen of the march. And I think it's important to think about how the march sort of framed who its uh, spokesmen were as opposed to the organizers of the march. Um, and the compromises they made with white liberals and organized labor and the Democratic Party concluding, and this is a quote from Barber, that negotiations resulted in decreased specificity, especially around the economic inequalities that had originally, um, it initially inspired Randolph. And I think this is a very common interpretation of the march that I think is largely inaccurate, with the idea that economic politics were sort of subverted in organizing the march. Um, I, I actually argue it's the opposite of the actual case. Um, I think Jacqueline Hall articulates this uh, narrative in, in her groundbreaking essay, The Long Civil Rights Movement, where she contends that anti-communism and Cold War liberalism silenced black trade unionists during what was known as the, the classical phase um, of the movement, destroying the civil rights unionism of the 1940s and marginalizing economic radicalism until the late 1960s when we see the rise of the welfare rights movement, black power, and the poor people's movements. Um, I actually think that a closer look at this event indicates that, um, that we might have it exactly the opposite, and that, that scholars have overstated the demise of civil rights unionism in the 1940s, I'm sorry, in the, in the 1950s and early 1960s. Um, at a time when liberal politicians were celebrating desegregation in Montgomery, Little Rock, and eventually Birmingham, as evidence toward, of progress toward racial inequality, Randolph and other black trade unionists warned that those gains were being undermined, um, and he very pointedly argued were being reversed by what he called the economic subordination of the American Negro. Um, NALC activists urged President Kennedy to add fair employment uh, provisions to his civil rights bill, but they insisted that equal access to work would be meaningless without more fundamental and very radical reforms to the American economy. Uh, the March on Washington forged a broad coalition of liberals and radicals who pushed Lyndon Johnson to declare a war on poverty, and in many ways framed the rhetoric in which he described the war on poverty, and to integrate equal employment, um, which was the, the, the a new version of the term fair employment, measures into the Civil Rights Act of 1964. By 1965, even Lyndon Johnson, uh, a white Southern Texan, would be convinced that economic reform represented, as he told the graduating class of Howard University, the next and more profound stage of the battle for civil rights. So in many ways, I think the sort of, the radicalism that we see at the late 1960s, in some respects, can be understood as an echo of this event earlier in the 1960s. Um, even as black trade unions placed, succeeded in placing economic justice at the heart of the civil rights agenda, however, their March on Washington coalition fractured along lines that would ultimately prevent them from realizing their objectives. Um, and this, again, I think we can return to these questions about periodization, and particularly the question about declension, so what we, how we think about declension. Um, the best known of these agreements, and I think you're probably the most familiar with these, emerged over the question of cooperation with liberal leaders of the Democratic Party. 